Uh, good evening, late afternoon, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, welcome to this inaugural lecture. Uh, we've neglected the inaugural lectures the past two years with COVID, so we're very happy uh, to be back to be presenting um, inaugurals. Um, of course, this is, I think, one of the pinnacles of, of the academic calendar, I suppose, right after the PhD graduations. I think this is really one of my favourite events at the university. So firstly, I'd like to welcome the Chair of Council, Dr David Norku, who is joining us online. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Vice-Rector Academic, Dr Ingela van Staden, who's also online. Um, my other fellow Vice-Rector, uh, Dr Malapo Kubela, who is the Vice-Rector for Institutional Change, Strategic Partnerships and Social Societal Impact. Uh, then the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Ag and Agricultural Sciences, Professor Dani Vermeulen, who's joined me on stage uh, this, uh, this afternoon or early evening. Um, then I'd like to welcome the Acting Head of Department, Professor Johan van Tol, who's also uh, on, on stage. Um, then, of course, I'd like to uh, welcome the man of the moment, um, Professor Linus Franke. Uh, Linus, thank you very much. We're looking forward to your inaugural. Um, and it, we hope that it will be a festive and um, inspiring event for you. I know he said he's not nervous, so um, we'll just confirm that in the first three minutes of his talk. <laughs> then I'd like to welcome this, some of Linus's guests. First, Elsa, his wife, is in the audience. Elsa, if you can raise your hand so that we can... Ah, oh, there you go. Hello, Elsa. Welcome. Uh, and then Elsa is joined by, her, by their three children, um, Marga, Karl, and Jan Adrian. If you guys can wave and say hello, that would be good. There they are, some small, some big. Um, and then um, Mr. Jan Pinar and Ms. Bertha Pinar, who is um, Linus's in-laws, also joined. Um, if you can say hello to everyone. There they are, colleagues. Uh, and then Dr. Kies Franke and Beb Franke, who is um, Linus's parents, are joining us online from the Netherlands, um, and a special word of welcome to the two of them. Then, of course, I'd like to welcome all the staff, the students, uh, friends like Francois of Linus. Um, I hope that you will share this very special occasion uh, with Linus and that we will all enjoy the evening together. It is then up to me to ask um, Professor Dani Vermeulen to introduce this evening's speaker. Dani. Thank you, Corley. Uh, this is going to, I don't know, this, this is the second of eight that we're going to have this year. So the two of us will have to get used to what we're going to do here. Now, Corley was lying. Linus is very nervous. I, <laughs> I, I went to see him yesterday afternoon and he said, yes, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> but it only takes a minute or two, yes, then you will be fine. Now, now, now this is, it's really a privilege to, 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 to introduce you to, to the audience here tonight. Now, I asked Linus, like we always do, to give us a short CV, and uh, I had to juggle the CV a little bit. To, to get it more interesting, Linus, because typical Dutchman, it was just facts. Eh? <laughs> so, <laughs> now Linus was born as Angelinus Cornelius Franke in Swartewal in the Netherlands in 1976. Now, just to tell you, 1976, I was a first year student at university. So, I'm a bit, I'm a bit older than you. <laughs> so, I was grade one. You were grade one. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the, the tough year in South Africa, 1976, and I was a uh, a, a country boy that knew nothing about politics at that stage. <clears throat> so now you, you were born in Swartewal, and I had to go and, and Google a little bit about Swartewal. <laughs> now, <laughs> there isn't a lot on, on the internet about Swartewal. It's a small little village in, in the south of, 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 of the Dutch province of South Holland, about 35 kilometers from Rotterdam. Eh? Now, the village of Swartewal has approximately 6,600 uh, inhabitants. <laughs> There's about 600 houses and it's built on about 0.33 square kilometers. So he's really, he was born a country boy. <laughs> now, I, then I also had to go and determine what is the claim to fame of Swartewal and there was nothing. <laughs> 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 the only thing I could find about Swartewal is, is all the wars between 
the families. I mean, there was the, the uh, Margaret, the count, Countess of Hainaut, how do you pronounce it, Hainaut, eh? and she, she fought with her son, William, and for, for, for being the leader of that area. But before that, in, 19, in, 30, in 1345, she succeeded her brother, William, who was murdered by her husband. So it's, it's a, very, a very funny uh, type of people that came from that part <laughs> of the world. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be family because <laughs> they, 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 they like to kill each other in the family. So. But to make a very long story short, eventually William, after his mother put him in jail, he was freed by other people and he became the boss of that area for a long time. So, uh, but it's, it's, this is in 1350. So it's, how rich is the, the history of, of the Dutch? I, I remember a few years ago, I was in, in Amsterdam, for, uh, Amsterdam for a few weeks and uh, I did a tour on the canals. And you see these little houses that's been built in the 14th century and they're still inhabited by people. I mean, it's, it's a history that we do not understand where you people come from. But now, <clears throat> back to the present. As a small boy, luckily they moved to Limburg, which is a bit bigger than Swartavala, eh? and which is, I saw, uh, well, I didn't know that, uh, famous for asparagus, Limburg. Yeah, you should know that because you're an agronomist. Eh? They call it white gold. And Limburg has got no fewer than 10 Michelin star restaurants. Did you know that? I know it's a place <laughs> where you can't yeah, so, yes. yeah. <laughs> But I, I, and I asked Linus many times, because he's only in South Africa from 2014, eh? yeah. why, doesn't, why don't you sound Dutch? You, you sound the same as us. You haven't got this Dutch accent. I've got Julko Lucas at the IGS. He's been here since 1985, and he still sounds Dutch. But Linus doesn't sound that. So I, I went to him yesterday afternoon. We had a chat. He said, no, the people in Limburg speak a different language. So I, I, I Googled that as well last night, and they say they speak Limburgish, which is, <laughs> which is something between Dutch and German. And I think that is why he doesn't sound Dutch anymore. I mean, you will listen to not people that doesn't really know him, that he, he hasn't got that strong Dutch accent that most people that come from that part of the world has. Now, uh, <clears throat> There was also something else that I read, and it said Limburg is quite densely populated, and crime is relatively common due to proximity <laughs> close, to, <laughs> close to Germany and Belgium. And I also wondered why you chose South Africa. And then I realized you feel at home here yeah, because of, of, of the crime in that area. So, uh, uh, so, so I don't know. But, okay, let's come back to, 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 to real life. Pro Franca did his BSc and his MSc, at Wageningen University. Now, all of us that's agriculturalist uh, knows Wageningen University. Most of us, a lot of us, has already visited Wageningen. And you did that between 1994 and 1999. And then he did his PhD at Glasgow University. And then I thought about the Scots. I was also a few times at Glasgow University. And that's where, I mean, the story of William Wallace from Braveheart. That was also people killing each other families. And I thought, <laughs> what is going on here? He came from one area where people, families kill each other, and he went and he got to do his PhD at an area that's got exactly the same type of history. So I understood why you, why you went to Glasgow. <laughs> now, during his career, he worked at different institutions, which gave him an edge over many, many other academics, in the sense that, as I call it, he has seen it all. Uh, from 1999 to 2002, he was a research associate at the Depart po Department of Crop Science at the Scottish Agricultural College. Nowadays called the Scottish Rural College. Eh? And he was involved in wheat control in India. What type of wheat is that? I'll talk about it. <laughs> You'll talk about it. Now, 2003 to 2006, he worked as a farming systems agronomist and as head of the agronomy unit at the International Institute of tropical agriculture in Nigeria. And that was in the time you did your PhD studies, the same period. I didn't mean India, I'll talk about it. Yeah, okay, but th this is how it was in your CV. Eh? In 2007 to 2010, he was a researcher at Wageningen, but actually at the Plant Research International PRI, where he focused on genetically modified crops, climate change, and projects that promote the cultivation of grain leg leg legumes, huh? How do you spread that word? Leg legumes, yeah? Across Africa. And then from 2010 to 2014, 
It was also at Wagen University, but it was researched at a plant production system, something a bit different. Then he came to South Africa in 2014. When did he, when did he meet you? In Nigeria. In Nigeria, okay. So that was before 2014, oh, yeah. long before that. Eh? And uh, he came to the current Department of Soil Crop and Climate at the university, and he was a lecturer till 2016, and then he became in 2017 an associate professor, and also eventually the head of the department, the academic head. Johannes only got uh, the title for tonight as, 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 as acting head. Tomorrow, Linus is the head again. Yeah. <laughs> and from 2017, okay, in 2022, uh, he also became a full professor, and that's why he stands here tonight, is uh, because he became a full professor. Now, throughout his career, he has worked on a wide array of topics related to crop production, food security, climate change, the buzzword, eh, and agricultural sustainability. Key tools that he used in his work include field experiments, farmer surveys, crop and farm simulation modeling, and advanced data analysis, linking detailed crop research to wider questions about sustainability and agricultural development is a key strength of his. As I've said it earlier, you have seen it all, eh? <clears throat> He's currently carrying out projects on the resource use efficiency of potato production in South Africa, the development of agronom agronomic practices of hybrid potatoes, the soil carbon dynamics in grasslands, and through PhD student projects, research of small little farming systems in South Africa and Zimbabwe. It's quite a mouthful. Now, Prof. Franke is an outstanding academic and has published 53 articles and book chapters. He has an age index of 24, and he has brought his uh, supervision to 17 masters and, f masters and six PhD students to a successful completion. And he's also currently the editor-in-chief of the South African Journal of Plant and Soil. Something that he didn't mention in the CV he sent me, but what I know is he, was, he also served as chair of the Earth Sciences section of the NRF Rating Panel for Earth Sciences. So for quite a number of years, but you're off that now, huh? off to Ukiah, you're lucky. So if you did not get a good rating in the last, how many years did you four serve? Years. The last four years, you can get hold of him afterwards. Huh? So uh, he was the chair of that meeting. So professor, congratulations on all your achievements. Congratulations again on your promotion to full professor, which is quite a while now. We're looking forward to your talk and good luck. Okay, thank Thanks. You very much. <laughs> Well, thanks, Prof. Corley, for the, the introduction, and uh, thanks, Prof. Dani. It's a uh, type of speech that we used to give, t typically give at a marriage where someone gets married. But <laughs> I mean, thank you very much for that. I, I learned some things about Swartzewal as well. Um, so, um, well, welcome, everybody. Thanks to, for coming to my uh, inaugural lecture. And um, I'm going to talk about well, one of the key themes in my lecture is sustainability. Now, one, look, one way to look at ecological sustainability is through the concept of planetary boundaries. So in these planetary boundaries, in, the, in this concept, it's assumed that the, the world can handle a certain amount of disturbance caused by human activities. However, if that disturbance gets too much and it crosses certain thresholds, then um, you kind of move into a danger zone and you have increasing risk of an ecological major shift, an ecological collapse. Now, let's say the smart people, yeah, they've, they've identified the main fields in which we as humans are, are kind of potentially unsustainable and quantified where we're standing. So that's basically indicated in this, this graph here. And if, when we're in the, the yellow or in the red, that means that we're in the risky zone. So if I just look at this, now which are the main areas where we are at risk? So that's according to this graph in the nitrogen cycle, in the phosphorus cycles, in, in land use, uh, land system change, in the loss of biodiversity, the extinction of species, in climate change and in atmospheric aerosols. Now what you also see in this graph in the green is the contribution of agriculture to the let's say, human disturbance. So you see that agriculture plays a major role in disturbing the nitrogen and the phosphorus cycles globally. It plays a major role, oh, well, that's kind of logic, because um, I mean, if we farm, we apply lots of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers. 
Um, agriculture plays a major role in land system change because a large part of the land surface has been converted for agricultural use. Agriculture plays some role in biodiversity losses and it plays a role in climate change. Now, I absolutely do not want you to leave this room thinking that I've said that agriculture is the main culprit for all the ecological problems that we face. That's not the case, but agriculture does play a major role in the key sustainability challenges that we have. Now, for a moment, yeah, just, you know, given what I've just said and given the need that we need, the, the need to feed a growing world population, now try to envision, envision sustainable forms of agriculture in future. Now, how will agriculture look like in a couple of decades? Yeah, just try to imagine it for a moment. Now, I'll guess that some people will think about a future agriculture as an agriculture full with technology. Yeah, they will think about self-driving tractors, all sorts of sensors on the, on the uh, Earth's surface, mounted on uh, drones, satellites, and all this seamlessly integrated using artificial intelligence and all of this together to make farming as efficient as possible. Yeah? Now other people, when, they, when you ask, okay, imagine a sustainable future agriculture, they will much more think in terms of uh, an agriculture that's um, based on ecological processes, agriculture that actually looks at, at, at how nature works and then tries to incorporate that in agricultural practices. So along that line of thinking, you probably have uh, uh, things like, you know, crops at, uh, farming that use cover cropping, conservation agriculture, uh, farming systems that have very short uh, supply chains. So there's a circular economy and nutrients can be recycled from where the food is produced and where it's consumed. Now, of course, in principle, it's also possible that you combine these two visions and you can, you know, you can grow cover crops with um, all sorts of latest technology. That's, of course, very well possible. But one thing I've noticed, if, at least if I ask my students to do so, that the kind of thinking often tends to go in either direction. Okay, now I'll come back to that later in my presentation. I'm first going to talk a bit about the, the research I've done in my career. Um, so yeah, I studied in, uh, in Wageningen, and actually I didn't study agriculture, I studied biology, but I did choose Wageningen that has a, a very strong agriculture focus, and I did my MSc on the control of wheat, wheat, common chickweed, salaria media, in wheat under organic management. And that was done at the Department of Theoretical Production Ecology, um, which is a department that was very strongly focused on, uh, well, one of the key areas was, was the analysis of crop production using this scheme. So it's about uh, calculating um, the potential yield, and potential yield is a theoretical upper ceiling for yield, as it's defined by environmental characteristics and, and, and the crop variety, defining a water-limited yield, looking at nutrient-limited yields, uh, measuring acting... Act um, find out what are the key limiting factors that limit uh, crop yield. And because potential water limited yields, these are not yields that you can measure in the fields, but these are kind of calculated yields, crop modeling plays a very important role in, um, in, in, in their work. So after I completed my MSc, I got my first job with the Scottish Agriculture College. And that brought me to the north of India. Um, now, the, the north of India uh, contains the Indo-Gangetic Plains. The Indo-Gangetic Plains, they're a bit larger than just of the north of India. It also stretches into Pakistan and large parts of Bangladesh. Now, a couple of decades ago, um, farmers would typically get something like one crop a year and one or two tons of, of, of grain from this crop. Um, well, if there's one place where the Green Revolution succeeded, then it's in this part of the world. Uh, what happened is the, the government had built major dams in the Himalaya um, and brought irrigation water down to the plains. Well, this combined with improved germplasm, so improved varieties, high-yielding varieties, the use of fertilizer, the use of agrochemicals to control biotic stresses. And in, in a relatively short time, farmers managed to double, triple their yields. And instead of growing one crop a year, they start growing two or three crops per year. Now, there were some negative side effects. 
uh, of the Green Revolution, and one of them was that they had a major problem with a weed, canary grass, um, that was a big problem in the, the winter crop, the wheat, uh, because it developed herbicide resistance against the commonly used herbicide isoproteron. Before isoproteron comes in powder form, you put it into the irrigation water and it takes care of your weed. Uh, then the weed developed resistance, so they had to shift and they had to start looking at alternative herbicides. Now, of course, these alternative herbicides, well, luckily they were available. The only problem was that they were considerably more expensive and they had to be sprayed properly on the, on the crop. And farmers had little experience with that, so they used wrong nozzle types, pesticide nozzles for spraying herbicides. Um, don't mention the use of protective clothing. Um, but it did help to control the, the wheat. And another thing that was coming up at that time was the di direct seeding of wheat seeds into the stubble of the previous rice crop. So that was advantages from, from different perspective. It gave the crop a head start relative to the, the wheat, the canary grass, but it also created a soil environment that was less conducive for the germination of phalaris. Okay, now from, from India, I went to Nigeria. Um, I worked for IITA, it's one of the CG centers with its headquarters in Ibadan in Nigeria. And there I was part of a multidisciplinary team that uh, was focused on improving crop production in the Guinea savannas of West Africa. And, um, well, there were, um, I, now, basically, I went from one area where the Green Revolution was a real success to another area where I wouldn't say that it never took off, but clearly it never had the same impact as it had in, in India. And farmers struggled. There was poor soil, fer well, was poor soil fertility uh, associated with the low use of inputs or fertilizer, manures. Uh, there were major problems with... Oh, oh okay. Major problems with Striga harmontica. Striga is a parasitic weed that attaches itself to the roots of the cereal crop. Um, and the other problem, there was a strong focus on cereal crops. And so there was a bit of a lack of rotation of crops. And that related to the other problems of, of, of Striga as, as well. Now, from the, the many things that we tried as a team, um, various uh, avenues that were explored weren't very successful. Yeah, so we worked on uh, alley cropping, just planting trees in, in crop fields. We worked on conservation agriculture. Uh, I don't think it has had much impact. And I think the key reason for that is that these technologies, they tick the boxes of the donor, but they didn't really tick the boxes of the farmer. Now, if I can select one field where we did have an impact, then it was the work on soybean. Uh, soybean is a legume, fixes nitrogen through symbiosis with rhizobia in the soil. Uh, and it's a, a legume, it's, good, it's a good crop to rotate with cereals. Now the problem, soybean was very unproductive in the 1980s and uh, it was not a popular crop because it did not relate well with the rhizobia that were naturally present in the soil in that part of the world. Now soybean is a rather specific nodulator. Yeah, these are the modern soybean varieties. They like to nodulate only with specific strains of rhizobia. And that's what commercial farmers want because commercial farmers, they add the rhizobia through inoculant to the seed at planting. So then your crop only nodulates with these effective rhizobia that you've just added. Now rhizobia is, uh, the, you know, the use of inoculants, it's a cheap technology, but it requires a bit of infrastructure and a cold chain to get them alive. Um, to the farmers, and that was absent in Nigeria. So then the breeders, they started breeding for promiscuity. Yeah, so they wanted promiscuous varieties. That means, you know, they do it with, you know, all the rhizobia that are there in the soil. Um, so they did that by crossing the modern varieties with traditional Chinese variety, and then they brought back the promiscuity into the modern varieties. Now, there are some breeders in this room, so I'd like to emphasize, when you work in an environment like this, breeding alone, almost never does the job, yeah? So you need the germplasm, the improved germplasm, but it has to go together with an improved agronomy. In this case, it was uh, the improved agronomy entailed you know, using more phosphate fertilizer, appropriate planting densities, and it also required some uh, distribution of post-harvest processing technologies because soybean is not a crop that you just boil and it tastes nice. Actually, it needs a bit of processing before it starts to taste good. But having that together, 
it really kind of took off. And if you just look to the area and the yields of, of, of soybean in West Africa, and I know these yields are not like what they are in South Africa, but you've seen a massive increase in both yields and in the area under soybean. So after Nigeria, I went back to Wageningen, and I worked for a couple of years for agrosystems research, uh, and that was part of Dienst Landbouwkundig Onderzoek, DLO. And the DLO has a similar role as the ARC in South Africa, um, but a key difference is that the DLO has been merged with Wageningen University. And at that time, I carried, so you can have more carry out projects like a consultant. And that time I had a range of projects around the sustainability, trade and communication in relation to genetically modified crops. That was a hot topic at that time. Well, it's kind of still is. And there was a lot of demand for kind of objective information about what is now really the sustainability impacts of these crops. I would say from a scientific point of view, it wasn't the most interesting type of work, but it was work that had a lot of society, societal impact. After uh, the time at DLO, I moved back to the university and I started working for the N2 Africa project. So that was a very large project, uh, promoting, aiming to promote the cultivation of grain legumes in sub-Saharan Africa at scale. Um, it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and if they fund something at scale, then you know it's like really big. <laughs> um, now, in essence, it was a development project. Yeah, so it aimed to stimulate farmers to grow more grain legumes in uh, many, at some point we worked in 13 countries in Africa. But we kind of also build a shell of research around it. And just to, to explain how that worked, so one of the key ways of demonstrating the value of grain legumes and the use of inputs and different varieties, the project used these demonstration trials. So this is this an example of a demonstration trial where you have simple kind of four treatments. You grow soybean without inputs, with phosphate fertilizer, with inoculation, and a combination of the two. And that you repeat then on many farms in a region. Yeah. Now, some of these uh, trials, of course, they give you strange results because they got waterlogged or eaten by goats, or there is a very strong fertility gradient. But it's about the power of, of, of large numbers, because if you repeat that demonstration trial at many times, you can kind of filter out the background noise and you do see to start, uh, you do see, start to see patterns. So just as an example, this is the response of uh, soybean in Nigeria, again, um, to phosphate fertilizer, inoculation, and a combination of the two. So all these dots, they represent measurements from the uh, treatment. So you see overall, almost all kind of treatments with inputs, they're above the one-to-one -one line, indicating that there is a yield improvement as a result of the use of inputs. You also see that farmers, that when the, 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 the yield in the control treatment is very low, then there tends to be very little of a response. Now, another way to look at the data is through probability graphs. So you can also say, what's the probability of getting a certain response? So you see here with inoculation and the use of phosphate fertilizer, they gave kind of comparable responses, and then the combination of these two gave an additive response. Now, we were actually surprised that the inoculation gave such a strong response because we'd assumed that you know, our varieties are promiscuous, so we did not expect them actually to respond so strongly to uh, inoculation. And in fact, it's this work that, that guided the decision to invest in uh, setting up an inoculation uh, factory and, and infrastructure in Nigeria because this is a very cheap way to, to, to increase yields. Okay, now you can, um, you can look to average responses, or mean responses, but you know, the means, they don't tell the whole story. You can also start looking, okay, now what's happening here with these farmers that, that have very little response, or what's happening you know, where, where we find very strong responses? What's, what's going on there? So just to take that one step further, I here show the results from a similar type of work, but then with climbing beans. And the trial setup was very simple. Yeah, it's climbing bean without fertilizer or with uh, the ammonium phosphate fertilizer. Now in Rwanda, the Rwandese government uh, did an interesting thing. It, it classified all the farmers into a socioeconomic class. Yeah, so it decided whether it considered yeah, the socioeconomic class, it's very poor, poor, well, or for rich. So they do this for the purpose of, of eight programs. But we made use of that to classify the farmers. 
So what you see is that the, the yields, irrespective of, of the response to fertilizer, you see there's a very strong correlation between the socioeconomic status of the farmer and the actual yield that the farmers manage to achieve. On top of that, you see that the response to applying fertilizer is also strongly correlated to the wealth status. So the wealthy farmers, they get the highest yields and they get the strongest response to the application of fertilizer. We also took soil samples and measured some of the key soil variables. And you also see there's a very strong gradient in carbon, nitrogen and available phosphorus um, with, with the poorest farmers sitting on the poorest soils and the wealthier farmers sitting on the better soils. Now we don't know if that's because they're sitting on inherently better soils or because that's because of management of the past or a combination of the two, but the impact is very strong. So, and if you on top of that look at the, the average farm sizes, yeah, so the, 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 the poorest group, they have on average 0 0.06 of a hectare. Yeah, so just remember the average farm size in Rwanda is half a hectare. Well, they have two growing seasons, but still it's half a hectare. Now, the wealthiest farmers, they're sitting about one and a half hectare on average. Now, if, um, if these differences in yields yeah, are indicative for the difference in yields of other crops as well, yeah, and of course your total production on a farm is your yield per hectare multiplied by your farm size, yeah, you understand that the differences in productivity at farm level between these poor farmers and the rich farmers is absolutely enormous. Now, if I ask you which of these farmers are likely to start investing in fertilizer, eh, obviously, it's likely going to be the, the wealthy farmers. Why? Because, well, they, they have the strongest response and they also have the means to invest. And this is a pattern that we see very often when we start looking at, at responses of, of, uh, um, of, of how of responses of, uh, to technologies is that um, the smallest farmers, even though you know, there are ways to improve their yields, but their small farm size is such a binding constraint that if you look at it at farm level, the improvements that you can make on these smallest farms are very, are very tiny. And... Um, any increase in yield at farm level is welcome, but um, it's also a reality because of these very small farms that farming for these far farming as a, as a way out of poverty is not really an option. So, I very much like the the way of, of looking at, at smallholder farms through the three lens of three rural worlds. Now, we often look at smallholder farmers as a relatively uniform group of people. Yeah, they're all, they're all small scale, they're all poor. Yes, that's true. But if you start looking at detail, you actually see there's a massive heterogeneity. And there is, in most cases, there's a small group, we call them the, the rural world number one, the guys that are stepping up. So these are the relatively wealthy farms, the riches of the poor, you can say. Um, these are farmers with access to capital, organization, information, infrastructure. So they are the ones that can step up. Yeah, they are the ones that sell produce, reinvest into their farms and, you know, gradually come up. Then there's a group underneath, we call Rural World 2, which is, you know, a large group of farmers who are kind of hanging in. Yeah, so they're more reluctant to invest in, in farming as part of their livelihoods. They're also likely to be less organized in terms of markets. They probably have some, need to have some alternative sources of income to get by. And then on the bottom of that, you have a very large group, and we call them the ones that are falling out. So basically, these are farmers that are extremely small. Um, they're not really in a position to sell uh, produce. They often need various livelihoods in order to, um, to, buy, to get by. Now, um, a donor like Bill Gates, but also the South African government, is very much focused on commercializing smallholders. Yeah, because they have with that idea that if they start to have access to markets, they start selling, reinvesting in their farms, and then everything will kind of start taking off. And there's nothing, I mean, it's important that these farmers are being helped, that have the ability to do so. But it's just the only point is that you bypass a very large group of farmers that don't have that ability and probably also don't have that aspiration to, to have their farms growing 
yeah, they, they, um, um, farming for them is not really a way out of poverty. And then the question always is, okay, then if, if they don't have that ability, they don't have that, that aspiration, well, what do you then have to offer to them? Okay, I'm now going to make a bit of a jump. I'm going to talk about potatoes. Um, so, um, my, my, my work with potatoes in South Africa it actually started long before I came to South Africa. It was already in 2013 I came, no, before that, 2009 I came to South Africa for the first time for potato research. And we started at that time in the Sunfeld. Now, the Sunfeld in the Western Cape is a kind of a, a sensitive area. It's in the middle of the Feinbos biome. And obviously, these farmers, they're making these large pivots in the Feinbos biome. So, it gave quite a bit of uh, environmental concerns. And, um, well, there's a lot, of, there are a lot of different definitions about sustainability. Um, and sustainability comes in many forms, and, and it's multidimensional. So if you want to get some sense into the discussion, you have to quantify it. In other words, I, I, mean, I know there's a quote that Prof. Dani likes to use, if you want to manage it, you need to measure it. Yeah, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's also very true in this situation. So we start with measuring the, the resource use efficiencies of individual potato farmers. So what you see here is um, the water use efficiency of a range of farmers. Yeah, so, well, I have two types of water use efficiency, but don't be bothered about that. The key thing that you see is that some farmers, they have a water use efficiency of around, you know, three grams per square meter for every millimeter of water. Other farmers, they can produce something like nine or 10 grams of potato for every millimeter of water. So in other words, some farmers produce three times as much potato for every amount of water than other farmers. Yeah? And if we do the same thing for fertilizer or for energy, we actually find very similar patterns. So there's a huge variability in the use efficiency of resources. Now, and the first thing that means that the farmers that are sitting here, yeah, they obviously have a large scope for improving their efficiencies. Um, but, um, but then the question is, okay, how can they do that? Yeah, so it's, 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 there's a lot of scope, but how can they achieve that? And, and what makes these farmers sitting here so efficient with their water? Now, in order to find out that, you actually need to go beyond service and, 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 and some modeling. You really have to measure in detail what's going on in the field with regard to the water and the uh, the nutrient cycle. So that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. We've done intensive studies in potato fields across South Africa. So we use, we use lysimeters, soil moisture sensors, we use uh, eddy covariance systems that measures the water and the carbon fluxes. Um, we, we, we use water flow meters to understand how much water is being added to the, um, uh, how much irrigation water is added to the land, and we evaluate the irrigation systems. So you need all that level of detailed measurements to really understand now why are some farmers doing better than others. So that gives a, a, a range of case studies. Um, and, um, and then from these case studies, you hope that you start to identify more general patterns. So just some examples of findings. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> um, we did notice that there are substantial nitrogen and potassium losses through drainage water in potato, but the phosphate losses are actually very scarce and they're actually very minimal. So I know that eutrophication of the Fowl River is a major problem with phosphate, but probably that phosphate doesn't come from the potato fields, but it comes from sewage or from other sources. Um, we also see that the water, nutrient, and energy use efficiency tend to be closely associated with each other. Well, that's what you would expect because how does a farmer lose nutrients? That's primarily through drainage water. And what are the main sources of energy that's needed to grow potatoes? Well, that's basically energy to pump up water and it's energy to produce nitrogen fertilizer. So um, they, they tend to be very... Uh, closely associated with each other. So farmers that are efficient with, with, with water, they also tend to be efficient with the other resources. Now, in general, farmers, they manage the irrigation scheduling quite well, but the problem is rainfall, yeah? Uh, because as soon as, as you get a lot of rainfall, you get drainage, um, you get nutrient leaching, and that's really hard to avoid, especially on the sandy soils where they grow the potatoes. 
And then another interesting thing, it needs a little bit of explanation, is we found that the radiation use efficiency of potato are higher than the theoretical maximum. Now, in crop modeling, the radiation use efficiency is an important parameter because it tells you the efficiency at which radiation is converted into biomass. And uh, according to the classical theory, you have an optimal radiation use efficiency. Um, so for potato, that's been estimated at 2.5 grams per megajoule. Now, when, it gets, uh, when conditions become suboptimal, when it gets too warm, too cold, or there's nutrient stress or water stress, this radiation use efficiency goes down. Yeah, that's the, the basis how crop models work. Now, you see here that, uh, according to the theory, the maximum radiation use efficiency is 2.5 grams per megajoule. Now, we've, with the help of this added covariance system that calculates CO2 fluxes, we can calculate photosynthesis rates, and we can calculate the radiation use efficiency. And we see that, actually, the radiation use efficiency that we observe in the field is more than the theoretical maximum. And it's even worse because if you look at the average, the average diurnal course of temperature, in this case for Launa, a place in the northwest, you see that for most of the daytime, the temperatures are actually more than what's optimal for potato. So basically, the potato should be considerably stressed by high temperatures, but in fact, the radiation use efficiencies are very good, more than what's, what's theoretically possible. I still remember my professor at Wageningen comparing, you know, uh, comparing potential yields with a physical constant. I say this is the maximum yield you can get for an area. It's comparable to the speed of light. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, our potatoes can travel faster than the speed of light. <laughs> now, the other thing that modelers like to say, like all models are wrong, and, but some are useful. Yeah? And yes, the model was wrong, but it did make us think now, why is the potato in South Africa so much better able to deal with the heat than what you would expect? Yeah? And it's not because the varieties in South Africa are uniquely South African or adapted to heat. They're actually rather common varieties. Well, we think it has to do with two things. We think it has to do with the large amplitude between day and night temperatures, and it has to do with the dry climate that we have here and the low relative humidity. So the plant transpires a lot because of the low relative humidity, and actually by transpiring, the plant loses heat. So we started measuring in the crop canopy, like the temperature, and compare that with the temperatures measured by nearby weather stations. And indeed, we find two, three degrees difference between the weather station and what the plant is experiencing in the crop canopy. So now the next question is, can we somehow manage that, manipulate that, that transpirational cooling, and can we benefit from it even more. And that, of course, especially relevant in the light of you know, climate change and increasing temperatures. Right, so now a bit of reflection. <laughs> so the studies on resource use efficiency, they provide a good example uh, in potato. They, they provide a good example of how research can contribute to improvements in ecological sustainability. And at the same time, to more efficient crop production. Now, the changes enabled by this type of research, they're typically modest. You know, we don't have really spectacular, spectacular results, but many small incremental changes can lead to consi considerable improvements over time. Now, going a bit, going a bit back in, in, in time, my MSc research was conducted on organic farming systems. And at that time, I was involved in the organic se uh, sector in other manners as well, because I was excited about organic agriculture as an approach that holds the promise of tackling major environmental problems in a radical manner. And not long after the completion of my MSc, I increasingly started seeing my flirt with organic ag agriculture as a bit of a youth foolishness, you know, as fed up as I was with the dogmatic and the anti-science attitude in this sector. Now, when I returned to Wageningen many years after, uh, I, I start producing reports about sustainability and trade impacts of, of genetically modified crops. And by doing so, inevitably, one gets drawn into the public discussions around genetically modified crops. And I, find that my, I ended up finding the people in the organic and the green movement against me. It was a weird experience. Like, guys, I just 
you know, I was one of you, and now suddenly I was, you know, one of these short-sighted scientists unable to recognize the, the eminent dangers of genetically modified crops. Now, strangely enough, when it comes to climate change, the Green Movement rightly says, follow the signs. Yeah, follow the signs dismissing the deniers, the deniers of climate change who come up with all sorts of obscure studies to prove their point. But when it comes to genetically modified crops, the Green Movement does exactly the same. They deny mainstream science and they come with all kinds of obscure studies themselves. And I started to wonder, now, what, does, what drives this polarized discussion on GM crops and sustainable agriculture in general? Now, surely there are opportunistic reasons uh, for the position of the Green uh, Movement. Yeah, GM crops, they're produced by large agro-businesses, so that perfect, uh, provided the perfect enemy to, to unite the people against. Yeah? Monsanto at that time was the one company everybody loved to hate. But I learned also that there's more to it. I mean, the strong and almost irrational opposition the Green Movement has taken against GM crops and in favor of organic agriculture is also a reflection of underlying emotions and values. So the line of thinking here is that uh, the ecological problems we face in relation to agriculture are caused by modern farming technologies. So genetic modification is seen as an extension of the technologies that were, were responsible for the problems in the first place. So to solve the ecological problems uh, that we have, we need to look back, at, back to nature. Yeah? We need to learn from nature and apply ecological principles to farming. So you can argue that this view is rather unscientific and kind of technophobic, um, but believing that new technologies will come to rescue us in the looming ecological crisis is equally based on a gut feeling. Yeah? You have no guarantees that the technologies will come to rescue us. And you can also wonder, are these gradual improvements in the efficiency of productions that we achieve by a new technology, are they really sufficient to deal with the huge ecological challenges that are ahead of us? Now, the organic movement has become rather stagnant. Uh, in Europe, it represents only 5% of the total agriculture production, despite the current policy aim in the European Union to increase this to 25% in 2030. I don't think it will happen. Now, in South Africa, the organic agriculture never really took off, and genetically modified crops have been relatively easily accepted. And over time, new approaches promising radical improvements in, uh, in sustainability have come up. So I think about approaches like conservation agriculture, holistic grazing, permaculture, agroforestry, and so forth. And recently I got involved in a project around holistic grazing. Uh, it's one of my favorite projects, and we look at holistic grazing from a carbon sequestration and a, and a, and a climate change perspective. But I was struck how some of the um, opinions and the atmosphere I encountered resembled that, uh, resemble my experiences with organic agriculture many years ago. Yeah? Including a distrust in what is called mainstream science and the adulation of their own heroes with their epic narratives. So a lot of the approaches that have now come together under the flag of regenerative agriculture. Which is, attractive, which is attracting massive attention at the moment, globally and in South Africa. And the hype around regenerative agriculture has stimulated the interest in using knowledge of ecological processes to improve agriculture production. So I think that's really something positive. Yeah? We see what can we learn from nature, how can we incorporate that in our agriculture practices. And I also find it great to see farmers in South Africa coming together and discussing in groups ways to apply some of these principles in their farming practices. But I think and many of the approaches that are now coming together under the flag of regenerative agriculture, they have proven their merits, yeah? but they have proven their merits under certain conditions. And I think this is where it's getting problematic. Because regenerative farming approaches, they're often promoted as globally applicable, applic applicable solutions to the big ecological challenges of today. Irrespective of the context and irrespective of the empirical evidence of the claimed benefits. So inspiration by nature does not necessarily lead to farming practices that are ecologically superior. So let's take conservation agriculture as an example. It's a key approach promoted under regenerative crop production. 
So conservation agriculture involving no tillage, continuous soil cover and crop diversification has been mostly adopted globally on large scale mechanized crop farms in Australia and the Americas. So there it provides benefits for crop management, it saves energy, cost and time, and it contributes to soil and water conservation, especially in drier regions. And the firm foothold that conservation agriculture has gained in the Western Cape of South Africa is much in line with that. Now in Africa, including South Africa, conservation agriculture is also widely promoted among smallholders, often with disappointing results. Small-scale farmers are, off, are, un, are incapable of maintaining the soil cover that's needed until planting of the next crop. And without soil cover, conservation agriculture does more harm than good. Weed control is a major, control, is a major constraint to applying conservation agriculture if farmers don't have access to herbicides. And even the, the, the very widely held assumption that conservation agriculture contributes to carbon sequestration and increases soil carbon. It's not a given in the light of the available evidence. So then you can wonder, now why do we keep on studying and promoting conservation agriculture in places uh, and in contexts where there's little evidence that it works? Well, I think part of the answer that is that conservation agriculture just makes up a great story that keeps on convincing donors and governments and international organizations. Now, large Food companies like Unilever, PepsiCo, uh, Nestle, they've all recently announced major investments in, into regenerative agriculture. Nestle, for instance, announced last year a plan to invest 1.3 billion US dollars into regenerative agriculture in the next five years. And this is part of its plan to decarbonize its activities, in other words, to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions assuming that regenerative agriculture will lead to large-scale carbon sequestration in the soil. Now, the big problem here is that, you know, the environmental marketing of regenerative agriculture is doing great, but it's way ahead of what farmers can actually achieve. It's highly uncertain that these investments lead to the, the claimed carbon sequestration. And investments into regenerative agriculture have become a mean to reduce the pressure to invest in curbing greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels elsewhere. Now, where does it leave us, us kind of uh, talking on, on behalf of, of, of people, academics working in the field of agriculture? Now, first of all, wouldn't it be nice if we can get rid of all the ideology? Yeah, at least as far as its research is concerned. Uh, it doesn't matter where the solution comes out of the an advanced lab or whether it comes from nature, if it works, it works, if it doesn't work, it doesn't. Yeah, a bit of free state mentality, you know? <laughs> However, unfortunately, it's not so easy, yeah? Um, food production, it's too important and too emotional for people uh, to leave it to specialists only. And unfortunately, agriculture science is just, it's not just a technical profession studying how to, how to produce food efficiently. Um, and all these non-technical people that are involved in agriculture have opinions about agriculture. Um, and you can't really get, get you know, you, you, they, they're there. That's just a, a, a reality. But just to use someone's quote, the struggle over the future of agriculture is being, pay, being played out as much in corporate boardrooms, through NGOs and PR agencies, and on social media as it is in academic journals. And scientists themselves, they're not free of ideology either. You know, it's either their own ideology or they try to accommodate the ideology of the donor. Now, secondly, it would be a major improvement if we can move away from the approach of embracing universal, universal principles for farming practices and try to adapt them or actually force them into a local context. Because that's what exactly happened with conservation agriculture. Uh, we have some universal principles, they work everywhere, and now it's a matter of adapting them to the local context. And a much more viable alternative approach would be to take the local context as a starting point, yeah, the agroecology, the environmental issues, the social and economic situation, and the aspirations of farmers and policymakers, uh, where do we want to go to? So agronomy and the identification and validation of new technologies or practices 
should be a place-based science in which local context and aspirations guide the way in which general production principles are applied. Thirdly, if you want to embrace the concept of sustainability, you must be able to measure it. So that means defining principles, indicators and norms for sustainable farming and quantifying them through empirical studies. We need well-implemented field trials and surveys. We need appropriate approaches to compare farming systems and deal with the many confounding factors inherent to on-farm research. But it can be done and there's a great demand for this. So with these, with these three final points, I've also indicated in broad lines where I see my future research lying. So I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, I would like to thank everybody um, I would like to acknowledge, well, there are some, there have been many colleagues in my uh, career that have been important, but there are a few co colleagues that have been absolutely, um, yeah, been seminal in, in either in terms of the contents of the research or in having the right attitude towards the research. I'd like to thank all the colleagues of Soil Crop and Climate Sciences who have come here in good numbers. Um, there's some uh, work from students, excellent students whose work I've used in this presentation. And finally, I would like to thank the support from Elsa, the children, Marga, Karel and Jan Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Thun, Prof. Mielen colleagues and friends and family of Linus and in, uh, Pro Franke. Linus, thank you very much. It was an absolute privilege to listen to your inaugural lecture. Very thoughtful and very thought-provoking. And um, yeah, it, it was uh, clear that you are contesting, I don't think so much for science, but for ideologies that are in the science. So you're contesting those ideologies with proper science. And that, to me, is, is very exciting. And just by looking at your, your career up to now, um, I think, like Dani said, you've been everywhere and you've worked on a range of different aspects um, and different disciplines. And I think that plays you in a unique position to be able to integrate complex scientific issues. And then you're able to ask those difficult questions that we, as colleagues at the Department of Soil, Crop and Climate Science, know that you're able to ask. For those of you who know Linus, um, whenever there's a student presentation or someone makes a statement, he would be the guy that asked those questions that you hoped no one would ask. So you try to hide them in layers of jargon or nonsense, but Linus has got the ability to cut straight through that to the core and ask those difficult questions. And what to me was exciting tonight is that he is able to ask those questions about his own career path as well and about his own research as well. And those are the difficult things to ask. I mean, for agronomists to ask or to say farming is not the way out of poverty. Um, I mean, you gave a context to that, but that's a difficult thing to say. And to say that um, you're ticking the boxes of a funder, but not the, the farmer, I mean, that's one way to jeopardize your career, to tell the funder that what they're doing is wrong. Um, but Linus is willing to do that. And also the, what Linus said about the regenerative agriculture and conservation agriculture, you can't use that as a blanket approach. I mean, to tell that to the FAO and to other of the big funders, I mean, that's a no-no. And Linus has got the courage to do that, and that is, um, I think, one of, to me, one of the key points of this inaugural lecture. So to me, it's, uh, it's not only very thoughtful, but it's also encouraging um, uh, to me personally, but I think to all of us, and even non-academics, is to, to challenge that status quo and to look at the norm and ask yourself, is what you're doing, is that the right thing? Is it the right place to do that? And should you be doing it at all? And to me, that is the encouragement and the, the really the, the key point that I take from this inaugural lecture. So thank you for that. And um, from me personally, but especially from the department, um, congratulations. And may there be many, many more successes in your career. Thank you. So we get to the end of the formal proceedings, and ladies and gentlemen, I would, um, there are refreshments in the foyer, but I would like to ask uh, Linus and his lovely wife Elsa just to take their place at the door, and then um, 
Yeah, after that we can, what do you call it, disembark. No, not disembark. <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, Linus, yeah, thank you very much. And um, just give him a moment to and greet the guest at the door. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, I think it's safe to go now. <laughs>